Well, thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation. As I was saying, it's it's actually really nice to be able to sort of go a little bit into the basics of quantum control because there's really not a lot of um, you know teaching materials on this topic. So so but um, fundamentally, the, I guess the question is so what is what are we talking about? What is quantum control exactly? And it's it's fundamentally just the question of how do you actively steer a quantum system in some desired way. Um, and uh, so since this lecture is, is focused on quantum computing, um, a lot of you are probably working at the level of a circuit diagram like this. Uh, but now from a control perspective, we're interested in how exactly would you implement one of these gates physically, like this controlled rotation, for example. Right? So in the, in the last few years, some of the, the quantum computing platforms like Qiskits, uh, they've added what they call pulse level control. Uh, so that's basically what we're talking about here. Right, and so it, it really goes to the physics of the platform that you're dealing with, and it's it's kind of the foundation of all of the the quantum technology that that we're developing, like like quantum computing, but also uh, quantum sensing and other stuff. And in in fact, if you um if um yeah, so so if you have a superconducting um, qubit, for example, uh, like this this transmon circuit, uh, where you have uh, two transmons with a shared transmission line, uh, and the control that you have in this case is the field that you put into the transmission line. Right? And now we're going to try to find a field so that every logical basis state uh, for a two-qubit system evolves so that it implements uh, this controlled uh, rotation here. Um, but, but there's other control problems besides just implementing quantum gates. Um, so in fact, if you go back to the origins of the field, uh, kind of in the early 90s, uh, that work really was about using light to control chemical reactions. So uh, where you have, you know, you have like an electronic surface and you excite the surface and then the, the uh, you know, the electron sort of evolves. And depending on where you uh, come down, you might sort of have like one of two different chemical reactions uh, sort of in a controlled way. Um, or something that's closer to what I'm doing these days. Um, so you could have some trapped atoms uh, where you split them into two trapping potentials, and then you move the potentials along two different pathways uh, to implement an interferometer. Uh, and then you have to find exactly the right trajectory uh, to combine the wave packets again at the end. So this is more of a transport problem, but that's also you know like a, a very typical kind of control problem. All right, so let me give an outline for uh, today's lecture. Uh, so I'm going to start by explaining how we formulate a control problem mathematically. And I'd like to use the example of the transmon qubits that I, that I just mentioned, because that's actually a very flexible system and it's also, it's not too trivial. So it's, it's actually kind of interesting, the things you can do with it. Uh, and I'm mainly going to talk about situations where we allow the control fields to be more or less arbitrary functions. So they can really ask fundamental questions like, uh, is there a control that can implement some specific gate? Uh, or what is the shortest amount of time that we can realize a gate in? So we're really focusing on unconstrained uh, control problems. Um, and the most straightforward method for solving these problems is called GRAPE, um, where you just calculate the gradient of your optimization functional with respect to your control. And then basically you just go in the direction of the gradient. Right? So that's, that's sort of the basic idea already. Uh, and, and that allows us to really go into the numerics. So I'll, I'll talk about how to simulate dynamics efficiently and how to calculate the gradient. And I'll also go into more advanced things uh, like this idea of semi-automatic differentiation that we came up with a little while ago. And, and I'll go through a, a specific example for optimizing a quantum gate uh, using a Julia library that, that I'm working on. Okay, so besides GRAPE, the, the other big method for unconstrained quantum control is called Kodos methods. Uh, so I'll explain that for a little bit. And, and then if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about some of the design principles behind that Julia library. Uh, so, so how you can make things really general and really efficient. Uh, and then lastly, I'll go beyond unconstrained controls and talk a bit about methods uh, for to optimize parameterized control fields. Okay, so, so let's talk about these, these coupled transform qubits, uh, which are really the foundation of what IBM or Rigetti or some other companies are doing. Uh, so this is a photograph of the, uh, the kind of circuit that they have, and uh, or the same thing, uh, more of it uh, as a diagram. And um, we, can, we can sort of go a little bit into the physics uh, of, of how exactly that works. So I'm gonna do that a little bit uh, blackboard style. Uh, so, so maybe probably a lot of you are, are somewhat familiar with this circuit, but if you're not, it's, it's really, so you probably remember from your undergraduate uh, how uh, you can have this classical LC circuit. Uh, so you have a, 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 an a, a inductive element and a, a capacitor. Uh, and you probably remember that this is sort of the prime example for a, uh, um, 
for a harmonic oscillator. Uh, and now with superconducting circuits, if you make it superconducting, then it becomes from a standard harmonic oscillator to a quantum oscillator. Uh, and on, on top of that, so instead of this capacitive element, uh, what you have is what is called a Josephson junction, uh, which makes this nonlinear, right? So, okay, so the Hamiltonian for this, um, so, so we have two of these, so we have two qubits, and they are coupled uh, with this uh, sort of shared uh, capacitive transmission line. So the Hamiltonian for this is, well, so it would be a harmonic oscillator. Uh, so we just have a frequency of the of one qubit uh, and then the number operator for that qubit, right? And the number operator is just going to be uh, the, the annihilation and creation operators, uh, which we're going to call B. Uh, so sometimes people call them A, uh, but we'll call them B here. Uh, so that's the harmonic part. And then because of this, this uh, Josephson junction here, um, we have an unharmonic term, which is just an unharmonicity alpha one for the first qubit half, and then n one um, uh, minus n one squared, and this is called a duffing oscillator. So it's kind of a, a common unharmonic oscillator. Uh, so and since we have two of them, we have another one, another term for the second qubit uh, with the the second number operator, uh, same term alpha two over two, n two minus n two squared. Uh, and then because of this uh, transmission line here, there's going to be a static coupling between the two qubits. So basically what can happen is that they exchange uh, uh, excitations uh, through, this, through this transmission line. Uh, so you have a, a static coupling of strengths J, and then you have this exchange interaction. So B1 uh, dagger B2. Uh, so you know, a photon goes from one, one uh, qubit into the next one, uh, plus the uh, Hermitian conjugate uh, B two, uh, and and then the control that you have is the con is a microwave field that you can put into this this uh, transmission line, and what that does is basically just drives the two qubits, right? So you have a, a field, and I always call my controls epsilon, uh, just from I guess the electric field, so it's kind of a traditional letter for the for the field, uh, and we're going to drive the uh, both of the qubits, uh, so we have B one plus B1 dagger, and then also the second qubit, maybe with some factor lambda in front, because you know they might couple sort of with a different amplitude uh, for the two different qubits, uh, B2 plus lambda B2 dagger. Okay, and uh, so the, the frequencies can really be engineered in like a very, very general way. Um, so you could have, uh, typically these are in gigahertz, so you have like omega one, could be uh, something like 4.4 .4 gigahertz would be typical. Uh, and and uh, usually you know you, the, the two qubits usually they are they have different frequencies and they should have different frequencies to make them uh, separately addressable. So this might be four point six gigahertz, uh, and then the harmonicities are typically on the order of a few hundred megahertz. You might have two hundred ten megahertz uh, would be typical for one of them, and maybe the other one is like uh, two hundred and fifteen or so megahertz. But these are you know these can be really made uh, to sort of arbitrary uh, numbers. Okay, and well, the next thing that we do is uh, we do a rotating wave approximation. Um, right, and the, the reason is that, okay, so the control field that we have that we put into the cavity uh, or the transmission line, uh, it's gonna be some shape uh, let's call it capital omega of t times cosine, cosine omega drive uh, t, where the omega drive is going to be something that off resonantly drives both of these qubits. So you could put it just sort of in the middle of the two qubit frequencies. So maybe like something like 4.5 uh, gigahertz or something like that. Uh, and then, you know, when you do a, a the rotating wave transformation, so you split this into one half e to the minus i omega dt uh, plus e to the plus i omega dt, uh, and you do sort of the standard wave trans the standard rotating wave transformation. And well, basically what happens is uh, you, you still have the same structure of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so we're just gonna copy that here. And um, the only thing that happens is that you get new frequencies. Uh, so like uh, rotating frame frequencies for the two uh, qubits, uh, which are gonna be the detuning. So it's gonna be the original frequency uh, minus the uh, drive frequency, right? Uh, so basically all we do is we get detunings here instead of the original terms. Uh, and then the other thing that happens is 
um, because now we only keep one of these uh, two terms here. Um, in principle, we get complex fields now. And, and moreover, um, if, we write, if we write it like this exactly, if we keep this omega of t real, it means we're driving exactly at the frequency omega d. But in general, we might actually want to deviate from that frequency. So we might want to change both the amplitude and the, the, the frequency of the field, which would now translate into a, a complex phase. Um, so what happens is um, that we have, uh, that this epsilon now becomes complex. Uh, so it's not going to be oscillating, it's still going to be a shape, but it might have a complex phase. Uh, and um, because we really want all our controls in general to be real valued, we're going to split that up into a real part and an imaginary part. Uh, right? So we end up basically with uh, omega, uh, a, a real part, uh, or epsilon, a real part. And then uh, we're going to add a second term, uh, plus i times epsilon imaginary part of t, uh, and that's going to be uh, sort of similar. Uh, so it's going to be uh, b1 uh, dagger minus b1 uh, plus lambda b2 dagger minus lambda uh, b2. Right, uh, and we also have a factor. So we get a factor one half from the the rotating wave from the one half over there. Uh, but basically, now the idea is we have two controls, right? Oh, immediately, and this is this is quite common. So generally speaking, uh, you have you you're allowed to have more than one control field. Uh, so this is like a very typical setup for an optimal control problem. Uh, well, and now in this this system, uh, so this is our Hamiltonian, uh, and um, uh, we have now that, uh, so remember that the uh, operators that we have, so the b1 is going to be a sum from n equal to 1 to infinity uh, square root of n uh, n minus 1 uh, over n, so the, uh, by n. So that's that's how you would write it in the levels. Uh, and now um, we're just going to take the two lowest level, so we're going to take 0 and 1, and that's going to be a logical subspace. And then we embed that in a larger Hilbert space. So this logical subspace is embedded uh, in a larger Hilbert space. Uh, so the larger Hilbert space would be 0, 1, uh, 2, 3, and so forth. And at some point, we're going to truncate that numerically. So we have a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, but we definitely have a logical subspace that's embedded in a larger space. And that's that's also very common. Uh, so and, and that sort of illustrates why this is sort of a good example, because it has these, you know, it has multiple controls. It has a logical subspace embedded in a larger space. Uh, so it's it's quite quite a useful, uh, uh, quite a useful system uh, to play around with. All right, um, so let's go back. Um, okay, so so we have our dynamics now. Um, so right, so the the dynamics are the we have the Hamiltonian, or it's a Liouvillean if it's an open quantum system, uh, and these now depend on the different control fields. And now we want to change these fields uh, with optimal control. And if you want to, the control procedure to produce arbitrary fields, you pretty much have to um, discretize them on, to some time grid, right? Um, because that's, you know, if you really want arbitrary fields, you just have to sort of allow arbitrary amplitudes. And then the standard thing to do is to take the controls as piecewise constant on that time grid. And then the optimal control will tune the values at the different time slices. Um, okay, so now we have, we have static Hamiltonians for each time slice. Uh, so it means that our optimization functional changes from something that depends explicitly on the time continuous control functions to the different values of the functions at the different points in time. Uh, and now we'll, we'll calculate the gradient as a vector uh, as the derivative with respect to each of these values. And once we have that gradient, we can put that into any kind of gradient-based optimizer. Uh, so at the very least, you would uh, just use some kind of line search algorithm to figure out how far do you have to go in the direction of the gradient. But in fact, what we generally do is use this method called LBFGS, uh, just after the initials of the guys that invented it. And that uses the gradient information to build up an approximation of the Hessian. Uh, so that, that that would be a second derivative, basically. Um, so, so basically, it just also takes into account an estimate of the curvature of the functional to figure out how far to go. All right, so let's talk about this grade method. 
So the, the grip method is really just the numerical procedure for how do you calculate the gradient specifically for the, the piecewise constant controls. Um, okay. Okay, so remember, so so first of all, what is the what is the functional uh, that we want to look at? Uh, so let's let's write down our functional. So optimization functional. Okay, and the functional is going to be uh, J of uh, epsilon L of T. So we have the multiple control fields, which are functions of time, and we're going to split that into a final time functional, uh, which is dependent on the states at final time t. And we're also going to, in principle, allow running costs. So we might have a running cost ga uh, that depends on the the, the, the control values, uh, uh, epsilon l of t, uh, dt, and maybe also running costs over the states. So these are usually called gb of uh, depending on the different states that we're looking at. Okay, but but you know, for the case of really unconstrained controls, we're really mostly going to be interested in this first part. So we're basically going to get rid of these uh, for the most part. We might we might get back to it later, uh, but this is really the one that you know the final term is really the one we're interested in. And now we might be want to do something like a C naught, uh, so we'd have a, a C naught gate, uh, which would be you know the typical one one uh, zero one uh, one zero. Uh, right, which means that our our target states are zero zero should go to zero 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 one should go to uh, zero one, and then if we have a one uh, in the first place, then uh, it should be swapped, uh, so it it should go to one one, and uh, one one should go to uh, one zero, uh, and then a typical functional that you would have for this JT term would be JT uh, equals one minus a normalized average over the different basis states. You would have a sum over K, uh, and then psi K uh, propagated to final time T, uh, and then the overlap with the target state, uh, where this here would be the target state. Uh, and then we take the, the, to get a real number, we would take the square modulus of that of that function. So that would be like a very typical uh, control uh, optimization functional. How do we calculate the gradient of this kind of functional? Right. So this really goes to uh, where we go to the grape scheme. Um, okay. So the functional is what I just wrote down. Uh, so JT is uh, one minus one over four, sum over k. Psi k over t, yes. Psi k uh, target, All right? Uh, and we're going to call this overlap here. We're going to call it tau k. So this is usually uh, the the uh, symbol I use for these uh, for these overlaps. Uh, and basically, now we can write that out. If we write out the square modulus, it's going to be one minus one over sixteen uh, sum over k k prime. Uh, tau k prime star uh, tau k, right? So this is just writing out the square modulus. Uh, and then the derivative of that is uh, delta jt over delta epsilon nl. Uh, so that's going to be, we can just calculate the derivative. So it's 1 over minus 1 over 16, uh, sum over uh, k uh, l, and then uh, delta tau k prime star over delta epsilon nl um, tau k. So it's just chain rule, right? So you just write it out tau uh, k prime star delta tau k over delta epsilon nl. All right, so this is just minus. 2 over 16. Uh, and now we can basically, if we if we split that sum, and we, we can see that the second term is really just the complex conjugate of the first term, so we end up with uh, the real part of the sum uh, um, of k and k prime uh, tau k 
prime delta tau k over delta epsilon and L. Uh, and there's actually uh, a, a separate way of doing that. Um, so let me go back to the slides. Uh, there's actually a second way of doing that, which is called vertical derivatives, which is sort of a concept of derivatives with respect to complex numbers. Um, which would, so it's really just a formalism, and it's, it's quite useful and something that we'll come back to later on. Um, so I just want to go through that. So in principle, if you have a real function jt that depends on a set of complex numbers tau k, you could just rewrite that as depending on the real and imaginary parts of tau k. Uh, and then the derivative is just the chain rule. Uh, so now everything in here is, is real, so that's great. Um, but you can define these derivatives with respect to complex values tau and the conjugate value of tau like this. Um, and, and the only thing that's maybe a little bit unintuitive is that you have a minus sign here. Um, but you can easily check that if you think as uh, of jt as a function of tau k, k and, and uh, tau k star, um, then, and then you do the, um, the, the uh, chain rule again, uh, you can really easily check uh, that that this comes out uh, exactly as the same result that we had before. Um, but if you look at the second term here, that's clearly, again, just the complex conjugate of the first term. So that whole thing just comes out as two times the real part of the formal derivative with respect to tau, as if it was a real number. Or if you prefer, you could also make it with respect to tau star, because, if, in fact, if, if jt is real, there's actually no way to have it depend on tau and tau star in any way that's not symmetric. Uh, so this, this really just works out. So it's it's a very uh, uh, useful uh, concept. Um, right. Um, okay. Uh, so now we can we can look at the gradients. Uh, so the gradient of uh, so now we're going to look at the gradient of this of this tau. Right. So that's what we need to know. Uh, so the gradient of um, of a state overlap. Okay, so we're going to look at d over the epsilon and l of uh, some overlap tau k, which is the derivative of d over the epsilon and l uh, psi k of t uh, and psi k target. Uh, right, and uh, well, basically, we know that psi k at final time. It's just going to be the initial state, so let's call that psi k of zero, uh, and we're going to propagate that forward in time. So we're going to have a time evolution operator u1 for the first time step, and then u2 for the for the, the second time step, and all the way up to uh, u n uh, for whatever n value is of the time grid. Uh, well, now we can we can insert that into the the derivative. So we have uh, delta tau k over uh, delta epsilon and L um, is just going to be delta over delta epsilon and L um, of uh, psi k um, of uh, zero, uh, and then we have u one dagger. So we're just in, we're just dagger, we're just taking the dagger of 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 this expression here. So it's u one dagger u two dagger uh, up to u n uh, dagger. Uh, where un is, is the value that we want to take the derivative at. So that's the, the time point that we're interested in. Uh, and then, you know, we continue on all the way up to un uh, dagger uh, applied to the target gate uh, as a sandwich like this. Um, well, and now basically what we do is we just pull that derivative into the term that we're interested in, which is, which is this term. Uh, so you're going to have psi k of zero uh, u1 uh, dagger all the way uh, up to un minus one dagger and then delta u uh, dagger uh, n, which is the one we're interested in, delta epsilon nl, and then we have un plus one dagger uh, up to u capital N uh, dagger uh, psi k target. 
like that. Okay, and now what basically what we do is we just take this, we just uh, split this up, and we're just gonna say this is psi k, the initial state, forward propagated up to some time tn. Um, so this is the forward propagation. And we're going to take these terms here, and we're going to apply these. Uh, we're going to sort of shift these from being applied to the psi k at zero to the psi uh, k target. Uh, so this is going to be. We're going to just going to call this state chi uh, k at time t n plus one. And this we're going to achieve by doing a backward propagation of the uh, of the psi target, uh, sort of you know going backwards in time, and just basically just using the uh, the Hermitian. Hamiltonian because we still have the, the we still have the, the the dagger here. Okay, so if we look at this equation, there's two things that we need to worry about. So one is the application of one of these time evolution operators to a state, and the second is the application of the derivative of the time evolution operator here. And we'll we'll look at each of these separately, starting with the application of the u. So so this is just the time propagation of a state for a single time step with a constant Hamiltonian, since we're assuming uh, piecewise constant controls. Okay, um, all right, let me go back to my slides. Okay, um, so now we have uh, our piecewise constant Schrodinger equation. And of course, we know analytically now that the time evolution operator is going to be, uh, it's, it's just going to be e to the minus i h d t. So instead of solving that as a differential equation, we can just evaluate that as a polynomial expansion. So think Taylor series, but in fact, the Taylor series is particularly bad at converging uh, as, a, as a polynomial series. So instead, you use Chebyshev polynomials if the generator only has real eigenvalues, or Newton polynomials, for example, for open quantum systems. And specifically, the Chebyshev polynomials are really a workhorse of closed system dynamics, and they're, they're really, really efficient. So that's definitely a numerical method uh, to be familiar with. Uh, so the definition of the polynomials is this here, uh, where the first one is just a constant, uh, the second one is just the linear term, and then after that the polynomials are defined via this recursion that always depends on the, the two previous polynomials. Uh, and all of this is uh, defined on the range uh, from minus one to one. Okay, so, so if you apply that to expanding the application of the exponential of the Hamiltonian to a state, uh, you, you basically get this. Uh, as, as uh, just an expansion into polynomials with an expansion coefficient a n. And the only tricky part is that because the Chebyshev polynomials are defined between minus one and one, uh, you have to normalize the Hamiltonian uh, so that its eigenvalues are basically between minus one and one. Uh, and it also turns out that specifically for the exponential, the expansion coefficients actually can be calculated analytically and they're, they're just basically related to the Bessel functions. Okay, so then you end up uh, with an expansion of the state of the state uh, psi at uh, uh, at uh, t plus dt uh, in terms of these uh, uh, in terms of these states phi that mirror basically the recursion relation of the Chebyshev polynomials. So this is all really very easy to implement. So you can see that the pseudocode for the whole thing is is really very short. Uh, so I can I can put it here on one page. And I just want to point out that when I mentioned that you have to normalize the Hamiltonian, you don't actually have to change the Hamiltonian. Right? So you don't you don't have to sort of actively renormalize it. You just need to have a rough guess for the lows and the eigenvalue, which usually you you do um, you know it from the physics. Or there's also very efficient methods uh, for getting approximate lowest and high eigenvalues uh, with with uh, numerical Krylov methods, and then you just take that into account as a scalar in the scheme, uh, like like this uh, this beta factor here, for example, right? Uh, so you just sort of uh, scale it in, um, and also in terms of the implementation. So this is this is the actual implementation that uh, we're using. So it's really short. Uh, so this this down here, just these few lines, that's the entire body of evaluating the series after the first two terms. And you can see that this is just basic uh, standard linear algebra blast call. So this is like, you know, a matrix sector multiplication. Uh, and, and really in every iteration, that's basically, so So you basically have just one application of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so this, this matrix vector product that I've highlighted here. And what makes it really efficient with blast is that these all these linear algebra operations are in place. So you don't actually have to allocate any new memory. As you really only need three pre-allocated states, which are these like v1, uh, v0, v1, v2, to store the states associated with the current order and then the previous two orders for the recursion. 
Okay. <clears throat> um. Okay, so, so now we know how to deal with the time evolution operator here. Um, so what about this derivative of the time evolution operator with respect to the value of the control field uh, at, at a particular point in time? So there's actually a pretty neat trick to do that. Uh, so it turns out that you can construct a larger block Hamiltonian where you just put the original Hamiltonian on the diagonal uh, and then the derivatives of the Hamiltonian with respect to the different control fields. So that's usually just the control Hamiltonian, right? So you put that in the right column. And if you evaluate the exponential of that applied to the, the state padded with zeros, like, like this here, you can show that you get a block vector where the different blocks uh, have the derivatives of the time evolution operator here. Right? And these, these daggers are just because we're doing the derivatives of u dagger. Uh, so that, that's a pretty, pretty useful thing, and, and we really use that very extensively. Um, and of course, you, you don't actually have to construct this extended Hamiltonian, right? So you just need uh, additional states uh, for these like different blocks here. Uh, and then you just implement the extended matrix vector product uh, for this kind of object. And then you can run that through the exact same algorithm that you use to do the time propagation, so the Chebyshev uh, propagation, for example. Okay, so that's everything really we need to uh, know to optimize for a quantum gate uh, using something like this, this square modulus functional. Uh, but what if we want to optimize for something more fancy? So if, if you look in Nielsen and Chuang, uh, it will tell you that for a universal quantum computer, you need a universal set of gates uh, with all the single qubit gates, and then you also need a C0. But in fact, you don't need a C0 specifically, right? So you, for example, you could also do with a controlled uh, phase gate, because you can just uh, add a couple of Hadamard single qubit gates to convert a C phase to a C naught. But more generally, what you really need is a two qubit gate that can generate entanglement, right? That's really at the core of, of universal quantum uh, uh, gates. Um, so we might want to optimize just for the entangling power of a quantum gate. And that's especially relevant for superconducting circuits because it's, it's really not at all obvious what entangling quantum gate is going to be the easiest one to implement. Um, so, so the basis uh, kind of for figuring out the entangling power of a two-qubit gate is what is called the Cartan decomposition, which is a theorem that you can write any four-by-four uh, unitary matrix like this uh, with single qubit gates uh, K1 and K2, and then coefficients uh, for these poly matrix terms. Um, so, so actually knowing these uh, C1, C2, C3 defines an equivalence class. So for example, C0 and C phase, they have the same C1, C2, C3, because you can go from one to the other with single qubit gates, uh, just adding them. Uh, and actually you can you can take these uh, C1, C2, C3 as geometric coordinates, and then you get what is called the wild chamber, which I've, I've shown here, where every two qubit gate is a point and because uh, there's some symmetries in this decomposition, uh, you you get you don't get like a full uh, cube, but you get you get this kind of polyhedron here. Um, anyway, so so how do we calculate gate concurrency uh, given a unitary? Um, so gate concurrence again. So that's it's the maximum concurrence of a state that you can get by applying the gate to a separable input state. Okay, so so you can calculate the C1, C2, C3 from the eigenvalues of the the product of this uh, unitary. Uh, with this with this partially rotated unitary, and then you take all the possible combinations of the C's and the sine, and and find the maximum. Um, and uh, but but just because you have the eigenvalues here, this is already clearly not analytic in the sense that you couldn't just write down a gradient uh, for this kind of functional on paper. Okay, so so people uh, in sort of uh, some years ago uh, turned to using automatic differentiation uh, to solve this kind of problem. And uh, the idea behind this is that you you build a computational graph uh, for the entire time propagation. So originally this was done in TensorFlow, which is really explicitly graph based. Um, but you know this is exactly the kind of you know the exponentiation of the of the Hamiltonian for the time evolution. So you just you just do the entire uh, time propagation instead of this graph, and every elementary operation in this graph has a known derivative, right? So this it's all additions or exponentiations or things like this. And basically what you can do is you can let the computer just apply the chain rule at each node in this graph. So as you as you do the propagation in this graph, you at every node in the graph, you store kind of a local a local derivative for whatever the derivative is of that of that operation. And then when you're done, you do a backward pass and you accumulate that gradient and you basically just by by doing it in this graph uh, you sort of automatically get 
the, the gradient for any computable function, including something that might involve eigenvalues, because even eigenvalues are ultimately, you know, are just sort of operations that the computer does on, on matrices and vectors. Um, but the, the problem with that is that it really doesn't scale because you really you need to build this graph and you need to store it in memory. And for every node in the graph, you need to store gradient information. Right? So this, this really, uh, in terms of memory and also in terms of computational efficiency, uh, this really doesn't scale uh, to large problems. Um, so we came up with this idea of, of semi-automatic differentiation. And, uh, well, the way that that works uh, is basically this. Uh, so let's let's talk about this idea of semi-automatic differentiation. Okay. So we have our, we want to calculate our gradient of our final time functional, and um, well, let's just take seriously uh, that. Uh, we wrote before that the, the final time functional is explicitly dependent on the propagated state. Right? So you have this, this is dependent on states psi k of t. And we want to calculate the derivative with respect to uh, the control parameters delta epsilon and L. And uh, well, this is, we talked about these working at derivatives. Uh, so we actually know now, uh, right? So the, the psi is a complex vector. Uh, so basically, the psi uh, vector would correspond to basically a complex number z, and the uh, the the ket, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, the bra would correspond um, to a um, z uh, star. All right. So this is this is the, exactly the kind of derivatives uh, that we that we talked about with the Wettinger derivatives. So I already know the result for how to apply a chain rule with this. Uh, so this is just going to be uh, two times the real part. Uh, so this is exactly the result we had before of uh, uh, sum over k. Uh, and then we have delta jt uh, derivative with respect to the state. Uh, right. So remember, we can just take the, we can just treat the, the ket uh, like it is an independent variable, and then times uh, delta psi uh, k of t with respect to the delta epsilon and l, uh, right? And uh, well, the only other thing we need on, on top of the Wertigen derivatives is that now we have a derivative of a scalar with respect to a vector. And uh, usually, you know, you would associate a, a ket vector with a, with a column vector. And if you have a derivative of a, of a scalar with respect to a column vector, you get a row vector, which basically corresponds to a bra, right? So we're just going to take this thing, and we know it's going to be a vector, and we're going to call it uh, uh, bra uh, k, uh, a chi k. Uh, so this is going to be a new state, uh, right? So just uh, if you write it like this, so k chi at final time t is just going to be defined as delta jt derivative with respect to the costate psi k of t. Uh, so that's our just our definition, and then we also realize uh, that the that the this this the, the first term here uh, does not depend on epsilon and l explicitly, right? So we can just we can just pull the derivative of the delta epsilon and l forward, uh, which ends up with two times the real part uh, sum over k uh, chi k psi k of t. Um, and uh, I forgot about the derivative, so the derivative is still there. We just pulled the derivative forward, so we still have uh, d over d epsilon and l. Um, okay, so this is this is what comes out. Uh, and while this we recognize, because this is exactly the same thing that we just uh, applied our grape procedure to. Okay. Go back to my slides. Okay, so this this basically leads us to uh, what I would call the generalized scrape scheme. Uh, oh, and I, I should say, okay, so maybe let me go back for a second. Um, so the idea of semi-automatic differentiation now is that you can you you take this thing here, and this is something that you can you can efficiently evaluate with automatic differentiation because this is really like a very 
um, like elementary computational graph. So it's it's just you know it's just a few numbers and a few steps. Even if it's not analytic, uh, you can sort of there's not a big graph behind this. So it, it from a numerical perspective, uh, this becomes this becomes very efficient. Okay, so we end up with a with a generalized script scheme. Uh, so this is kind of the numerical scheme behind everything. Uh, and what you do is you take your initial state, uh, so one of the, the, the k states, so psi k or phi k, for the initial state, you propagate it forward with your with your guest pulse, uh, and you store all of these all of these states at each point in time, right? And then once you reach the end here, um, you use the uh, automatic differentiation to calculate the state chi here, which is just the derivative of the functional with respect to that state. Uh, and you also extend it uh, for sort of this gradient uh, gradient generation that we talked about, where you pad the states with zero and you have sort of this extended Hamiltonian. Uh, so, so you pad it and you get this, this tilde here, uh, and then you just do a, a backward propagation uh, of this extended state uh, to basically calculate the gradient of this of this overlap tau, which now has, you know, is the overlap of chi k and, and psi k. Uh, so you just go backwards in time. And at every point in time, as you go backwards, you take the overlap of this extended state and this the, the state that you stored from the forward propagation, and you get the contribution to the gradient of the of the the the, um, the tau at the end. And then once you you go through and you have all these values, you basically just uh, you know you you complete it uh, by taking the the the, the sum uh, of all the different case uh, of these different gradient vectors, and in accordance with the Wurtinger derivative you take two times the real part, and that becomes the gradient for the entire functional. And the nice thing is so you can do that now for any computable functional, right? Because the only thing, uh, everything here is completely analytic and, and sort of very straightforward. And the only thing that where the non-analytic functional enters is the chi, and this you can do very efficiently with automatic differentiation. Okay, so let me go through an example of how that actually looks in practice. Uh, so this is, this is a, a notebook using this, um, using this uh, Julia library that sort of implements these methods. Uh, so this is, again, the same example that we had for the entanglement quantum gate. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can just define our Hamiltonian. Uh, and the Hamiltonian is going to be defined exactly like I wrote out on paper. So it's kind of a nice a nice thing uh, that you can sort of write it out in this, in this sort of very concise form. Uh, and all the operators now, of course, we construct them as uh, just sort of simple sparse matrices uh, corresponding to what the, the raising and the lowering operators are. And the parameters are also the ones that I that I wrote down. So like gigahertz for the qubits. Uh, and then we have a drive frequency. So we also go to the rotating frame uh, and we have, you know, we have a real and imaginary part. Uh, okay, and so that's just the Hamiltonian. And our initial driving field uh, is gonna be uh, an amplitude that goes from zero to some value of 35 megahertz uh, stays on for a while and then goes down again. Uh, and uh, well, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to separate that into um, a shape. Uh, so we want to make sure that this pulse stays zero at the beginning at the end. So we're going to separate it into a shape, uh, which is this this flat top function here uh, that that you know goes from zero to one and then stays one and goes down again. And then the actual control. So that's the thing that we're going to modify. Uh, so we're going to have this this shaped amplitude. Uh, that you know uses this shape and then multiplies it with uh, in this case a constant. So so initially we're going to say we're going to be exactly at the driving frequency. So the real part is just going to be the 35 megahertz, and then the imaginary part is going to be zero initially. Right, so that's our function. Uh, so we can we can plot that, and you know you can see that's exactly what I just described. And with that we can instantiate the Hamiltonian. Uh, now for the states, uh, so we just construct the 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 states of the of the uh, two qubit gate uh, as as cats and uh, like I was sort of saying before, so we're truncating this whole system at six levels per qubit. So the actual logical subspace is going to be embedded in a in a larger Hilbert space, and we can see that if we look at uh, just like the zero one vector, it's going to be a thirty six dimensional vector. Uh, so it's basically like a padded uh, two qubit states. Okay, so now we can look at the at the what happens under the guest field. Uh, so we're going to use the the propagate function, uh, which implements the the Chebyshev, uh, for example, or other methods as well. Uh, but we're going to be using the the Chebyshev propagation here. And just to analyze things, uh, we're going to look at we're going to um, look at the overlap of the propagated state, uh, which e with each of the basis states. 
uh, so we can we can call this propagate function. Uh, so we, we do four propagations, one for each of the basis states, and we use this this overlap here as some as an observable that we store. Uh, so what comes out of this is just a matrix for, for every point in time here just for the last one. For every point in time, we have sort of the, the overlaps with the four basis states, and then we can concatenate uh, th those four uh, propagations uh, into a four by four matrix U that is basically the gate in the two qubit subspace at, at each point in time. Um, so we get the, the, the gates, and now we can analyze that in terms of the gate concurrence. So that's what we're gonna what we're gonna optimize. Uh, but there's also, because we have that logical subspace, we might also have loss from that subspace, right? So we have to check the unitarity as well. Uh, and and well for the gate concurrence, so as I said before, so this is the amount of entanglement you can generate, and you know probably the most well known gate is the C naught, uh, and uh, well you can you can verify that if you plug in a C naught into this gate concurrence, uh, you get a value of one. Anyway, so we can we can now plot the gate concurrence for every point in time, and you can see of course initially you don't have any entanglement, so the initial gate is going to be the identity, uh, and then it's fluctuate, but you only reach ever about uh, I don't know, let's see like. Uh, 70, 78% entanglement. So you're not, you're not reaching a perfect entanglement like a C naught or like a C phase. Um, and moreover, uh, if we look at the loss of population from the logical subspace, um, so the, we can actually see that the, the four by four matrices are not unitary, right? So we have something like 15% or at the end, I think we have about 9% yeah, loss of population from the subspace. Okay, so now we can we can maximize that, uh, and what we do is we define these objectives, which are, should probably be called trajectories. So these are basically the initial state and the generator, which is the Hamiltonian. So this is basically the states that we want to look at and how they evolve in time. Uh, and um, then the functional that we want to optimize is a combination of the gate concurrence, but also the the unitarity measures. So we want to maximize the gate concurrence, and we want to also maximize the unitarity, so minimize the loss from the, the subspace. And while well, we can check that if we plug in the result of our forward propagation, um, so this, this functional should go to zero, uh, but if we check it, it, it actually goes to, uh, you know, not, not quite something quite far from zero. Okay, um, so now uh, just for, for sort of formal reasons, uh, so this, this optimization function, it's gonna need uh, the it's going to need a functional that takes the propagated state as input, uh, whereas what we define here takes a four by four matrix as input. So that's just a, a function that that does that conversion for you. Uh, okay. Well, and then the sort of the the critical part of the the whole uh, of calculating the gradient is generating this chi state. Uh, and so we we just we know the functional and we use this routine, and this is where the automatic differentiation comes in, right? So this, this bits also something that uses the zygote. So zygote is, a, is an automatic differentiation package in Julia. Uh, so basically this returns a function uh, via automatic differentiation that just calculates the relative of this functional that we define up here. Well, and with that, we can define our control problem. Uh, so the control problem is just the objectives or maybe they should be called trajectories. Uh, we give it a time grid, we give it the functional, we give it the, the state chi that we just constructed uh, that, that goes into the gradient, and then we give it you know, some information of when, when to stop. Um, well, and now if we run this, uh, so we just call an optimize function, and you can see here that in a few seconds, you can see the value of the functional going from you know, 0 0.116 uh, down to 10 to the minus four. Uh, so you, you, you end up uh, with uh, uh, presumably a, a perfect entangler, and you can see if you look at the what the optimization did. So you basically added these sort of kind of oscillations on the field. Um, right. So the if you look at the dynamics of the field, so we're just going to get the original controls from the Hamiltonian, and now we're going to substitute uh, into the we're going to change the Hamiltonian. We're going to substitute the original controls with the controls that we got from the optimization, and repeat the the propagation again. And now if you plot it, um, so the, the blue curve, that's the, the entanglement that we generate. And you can see here now that you know it goes to, to one at the end uh, compared to the, the guess in red. And uh, um, so you can also check it. And likewise, if you plot the uh, loss uh, of population from the subspace, you also see that, uh, well, there's still, you know, there's still loss during the evolution, but at the end in the blue curve here, we go back down to zero. Uh, yeah, and that's you. You basically have you know less than uh, zero point zero six or something percent uh, loss of population from the subspace. Okay, so that's that's how that works as an example.
Um, okay, so so let's sort of reflect a little bit. Um, so we have so we have the grape scheme, which basically comes down to discretize first and then calculate the gradient. Uh, and the alternative would be uh, to do some kind of variation of calculus where we look at the at the derivative of j with respect to uh, with respect to epsilon of t as a function. So it's like a functional derivative, and then you discretize. And uh, well, there's this actually also goes back to the beginnings of the um, of the kind of the field. Uh, so there's the adjoint method where you basically just take your functional and you add the, the Schrodinger equation as a constraint with a Lagrange multiplier. And the Lagrange multiplier is basically the same state chi that we had before. Uh, so actually uh, doing this, you kind of get like a very, very similar scheme uh, to what you get with a grape, which is why I think these methods aren't really, uh, they're not really sort of actively used. Uh, but the other method is, is Kotov's method, uh, which sort of uh, has a similar approach of doing variational calculus, but it's more of a constructive approach. And uh, well, that that is something that uh, sort of is 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 actually quite interesting. Um, so so what happens there with Quartos method is um, that uh, again we have our functional. So we have uh, j is j the final time functional with respect to the states psi k of t, um, and then we also have you know, the running costs, at least in principle. So you have GA of uh, epsilon um, L of T, DT, and then maybe we also have a term GB, uh, you know, another function that, that um, deals with uh, the states, uh, but we're, we're gonna not worry about this, this very much. Uh, you can also do that, but it's a little bit more complicated. And now the idea is, so I give you a, uh, a guess field, uh, so, it's a guess epsilon, and I give it a, a superscript zero. So this is the the, the guess in a, in a given iteration of the algorithm, epsilon of t. And then we do the necessary and sufficient conditions conditions for a new field. epsilon L, and we're going to give that superscript one of T, um, so that J of epsilon one of T is uh, at least, you know, is smaller or equal to uh, J of epsilon uh, zero, basically, right? So, so basically just a constructive, so basically just saying, what are the conditions that, that sort of would do this as a constructive thing? And well, what you come up with, uh, if you do the math and the math, you would probably spend about an hour sort of just going through the math of that. But the condition that comes out is that the derivative of the GA with respect to the field, uh, uh, to, the, to the guess field, is gonna be two times the imaginary part, uh, sum over K, uh, chi K, uh, uh, using the the guess field, and then you have dh over d epsilon, uh, and then psi k, and then uh, a propagation using the updated field uh, like this t. Uh, well, and well, that doesn't really help very much because that's just a condition. Uh, but now we actually we're not going to get something unless we have a ga, right? So we're just going to add a ga. And the GA that we're, we add, uh, that's sort of the uh, sort of standardized. It's always kind of the same function. And it doesn't really have a physical interpretation, right? It's not. It's not really that you add a physical constraint on the on the on the fields. Uh, but we're just going to add delta epsilon uh, L of t uh, squared dt, where delta epsilon is defined as uh, just the up, the new field uh, uh, minus the uh, the guess field epsilon zero of t. Um, right, so it's just a pulse update. And now, well, the derivative of that is just going to be uh, two times two times lambda a over s of t, and then delta epsilon. So it's you know just the derivative. So this this now gives us something where you can say delta epsilon on the left hand side. So this is sort of what stays over. So so everything all the the constants we sort of move it over to the right side. So delta epsilon is going to be s of t uh, of lambda a and then sum over k, uh, chi k um, of uh, zero of uh, t dh over d epsilon, 
uh, so I K uh, like this. Okay. Um, so that's that's that. And uh, well, that if we if we look at how that turns into a scheme, um, so it's basically it's kind of a similar scheme. Um, so what we do here, so we do have to one, do one pro propagation, one time propagation of the initial field uh, to sort of uh, you know see what happens, and then we use we use a chi that's the exact same chi that we had with grapes. So this is the derivative uh, of the functional with respect to the to the forward propagated state. And again, you can you know you can do that with automatic differentiation if you want. Uh, and now we're going to backward propagate that, uh, and we're going to you know backward propagate it with the gas pulse, and we're going to store all of these states, and now. Once we, we do that, uh, what we do here is we uh, take the we take the four propagated state. So this is the initial state here, and we uh, you know we evaluate the right hand side of that equation that I just wrote down, and that gives you the new field. So the delta epsilon is going to be uh, derived from this overlap, uh, and then the interesting thing is that we now forward propagate uh, this state with this with this new field, and this gives us the next state, and then you know we can calculate the next update, and we we go forward. Uh, with the updated control. So if you, if you compare the grape and the the Kortos method, uh, we see they look kind of similar. Um, they they you have a forward propagation and a backward propagation. Uh, so you have to do them in different order. Okay. So for for the grape, um, do you, and also for the grape you you use the the extended state for calculating the gradient and the backward propagation. Uh, but the most crucial difference really is that in grape you do both propagations with the guest pulse. So all the values of the gradient are in some sense independent. Whereas for the Kortos you use the in the forward propagation. You immediately calculate a new field in each time step, and then you use that new field uh, to to propagate uh, one step forward. So this is called a, a sequential update because the update in each time step depends on the update from the previous time step. So this actually makes Kotter's method converge a little bit faster. But then on the other hand, uh, with Grape, you you uh, you have the LBFDS. Uh, so, so that's set. set Sorry, that estimates the second order Hessian. Uh, so people have found that you can basically you start with Kortov for the first iterations, uh, so exploiting the sequential update for faster conversion. And then at some point you switch to Grape once your convergence sort of goes asymptotic. Um, but the sequential update in Kortov really has some consequences for how you numerically implement your propagator, because you need to be able to mutate your pulse values for the next time step while you're doing the time propagation, and that's something that that really caused issues in our Python when we implemented this in Python. Uh, with this method, because uh, there really isn't any good propagator available in Python that that supports this kind of uh, mutating while you while you do the the simulation. Okay, um, so so uh, so we have this implemented in this quantum control library, but I think in in terms of uh, time we're kind of uh, running out of time. So I think I'm gonna skip going over uh, sort of the uh, you know the concepts of this library. Uh, so this is something uh, I, I gave a talk at JuliaCon a couple of weeks ago, which should show up on YouTube. Uh, within the next few days or so, uh, so that really goes into the details of that library. So I'm going to skip sort of the the design details here. Uh, but you know, we really tried uh, to make make a library that's really both maximally efficient and also maximally general, um, uh, sort of uh, compared to based on the experiences that we had with uh, with Fortran and also with Python. Okay, and just to sort of conclude, I, I, I do want to say a few things about uh, parameterized control fields. So, so far, we've basically talked about unconstrained optimization, right? Because that's, in some way, that's the most uh, uh, general method, uh, because you can get arbitrary optimized control functions. Um, and there are some ways to add constraints in Grape and in Kotov, like you can do some amplitude constraints or some spectral constraints with some, with some tricks. Uh, but sometimes you really want to have a much simpler function. Uh, usually because you have experimental constraints, or you know there's some limitations on how good your pulse shaper is in an experiment. So instead of piecewise constant pulses as sort of a proxy for arbitrary uh, arbitrary functions, you could have some analytical function that depends on just on a handful of parameters. So in the simplest case, that would be maybe just a Gaussian, and then the parameters would be the time of the peak and the amplitude and the width, uh, or you and then you could just optimize those parameters, right? Um, just sort of vary them and sort of figure out what the, what the best parameter is, uh, or something that's been used quite successfully is this uh, chopped uh, spectral basis, where you take a handful of spectral components uh, with sort of random frequencies uh, omega n, uh, and you then optimize these these uh, Fourier coefficients a n uh, and b n. Um, so that sort of gives you something very general. And as long as you only have a handful of parameters, like maybe a dozen or two, you can use gradient free methods. 
uh, where you just simulate the dynamics and then vary the parameters, uh, or you can just sort of roll downhill in the optimization landscape using something like a, a Nelder meet method. Uh, but in fact, more recently, people also started to figure out how to calculate gradients with respect to these control parameters. Uh, and th the key to that is the exact same trick that we use to calculate the gradient of the time evolution operator uh, with a constant Hamiltonian for just a single time step. Uh, so that basically just the idea that you, you pad the state with zeros, and then you have this extended generator where you put the original Hamiltonian on the diagonal, uh, and then the derivative of the Hamiltonian now with respect to each control parameter in the right column, and you just do an entire time propagation. So you know instead of doing just a single time step, you just do whatever, you know put it into like a, uh, an ODE software or something like that. Uh, and basically that will automatically give you the relative of the propagated state uh, with respect uh, or the derivative yeah of the um, yeah derivative of the propagated state with respect to the control parameters. Uh, so that's kind of the key to calculating gradient. Um, and, and that opens up a lots of possibilities, right? So in general, to get the best results, you would you would switch between these different methods. Uh, so maybe use a simple parameterization with a gradient free optimization to get like a good guess pulse, and then you put that into grape or into Kortov, and then maybe you use a more elaborate uh, parameterization again to adapt that uh, to an experiment.